Kia ora koutou, and welcome to Board Game Basics, an irregular series from 3-Minute Board Games. In this series, we look at board game mechanics and board game terminology and break them down and explain them in a way that hopefully is easy to understand. Today we are looking at worker placement, a really common mechanic that features in a hell of a lot of games these days. In fact, all of the games in front of me are worker placement games in one degree or another. So in this video, we're going to define what worker placement is. We're going to look at the defining features of an archetypical worker placement game. We're going to look at some of the exceptions and variations within the worker placement genre. And then we'll briefly talk about the history of worker placement games and how they fit into this whole board game hobby. So let's cut to the chase and go straight to the definition. At its most basic, worker placement is taking a worker, placing it on the board and getting the associated benefits. But there's a little bit more to it than that. And I could probably be done with the video right there, but I think this needs a little bit more explaining. And I feel that there are three defining features of what makes a worker placement game. The first of which is there is a resource of workers that is scarce. Now in order for a worker placement game to work, there cannot be an unlimited number of workers. The act of placing workers on the board must be using up a limited pool of workers you have available to you. And this scarcity represents a decision point in the game. How do you use your limited pool of resources and maximize the returns? The second part of the definition is that the core gameplay must revolve around centrally contested spots. That's not to say that you can't have uncontested or personal spots in a worker placement game, but the core of the gameplay has to revolve around central spots that you are competing for. Therefore, you are using a limited resource of workers on a limited selection of spaces. And those spaces are granting different bonuses and different rewards. And the third part of the definition is that the majority of workers are not permanently placed on the board. They can be removed and reused in later rounds or at a later time during the game. Now it's okay to have some spaces that are permanently locked down, but the majority of workers should return to their owner at some point during the game. Now if the whole game revolved around placing workers in places and they stayed there for the whole game, that wouldn't be worker placement. The majority of those spaces have to clear out at some point during the game. And this creates what is the core worker placement gameplay loop. At the start of a round, you receive a certain number of workers. You then place them in contested locations in order to get the maximum benefit for yourself over the other players. Then at the end of the round, those workers are removed from those spots and go back to your hand to be used again later. Now using those three criteria, let's look at some worker placement games. In Agricola, you have a limited number of workers, two to five, so they are a scarce resource. There are limited worker placement spots and you place in turn order and only one worker can go on most spaces. Then at the end of the round, those workers are reclaimed and go back to your hand. In Energy Empire, you have a limited number of workers and they are placed on spots to activate them. However, if there is a worker already in that space, you can use an additional worker or power to be able to use the space, but that's an additional cost. Each space you use gives you a benefit or a reward. And when you generate power, the workers are removed from the board and go back to your hand to be used later. Now some games mess with this format a little, but still keep the core principles there. In Raiders of the North Sea, you only ever have one worker. And if you're using the worker placement spots at the bottom of the board, you place one worker and then take one worker into your hand. But there are also raid spots, which are not really worker placement spots. There you permanently assign your worker, claim the rewards, and then claim another worker. So it sort of short circuits that standard system. The same is true for Architects of the West Kingdom, which doesn't have the refresh phase. You can keep placing workers from your pool of 16 onto the board, but eventually people will arrest them and take them away and you have to take an action yourself to reclaim them. And then there is a game like Paladins of the West Kingdom, which a lot of people think of as worker placement. Yes, you have workers and they are a scarce resource, but you only ever place them on your own board, with the exception of the very limited contested spots in the middle of the board. For me, that tiny bit of worker placement doesn't necessarily make Paladins of the West Kingdom a worker placement game. It has elements of worker placement in it, but it's only a very small part. Then there are games like Scythe, which have worker tokens that go on the board, but they're not placed in action slots. You can take actions from your action selection board to get resources with them, but that is not worker placement. One of the big variations on worker placement is dice placement, and I consider this a subgenre of worker placement. The main difference between a dice placement and a normal worker placement game is the worker isn't a meeple or a piece, it's a die, and the value on the die frequently changes the impact of what the workers are doing. A good example of this is the Artemis Project, where you place dice on the board as you would workers, they're a scarce resource, but the value of the dice changes the benefits you get from them. 
They're also recovered and refreshed at the end of the turn, like a classic worker placement game. Another variation on worker placement is specialist workers. In a specialist worker placement game like Anachrony, different locations will give extra bonuses to different worker types or be completely restricted to other types. This is another level of complexity that adds additional scarcity to both the type of workers you have and the locations that you can place them. Before about 2005, there wasn't much buzz around worker placement games. There'd been a few games come out like Bus in 1999, Aladdin's Dragons in 2000, and Cathedral in 2002, which had done all right, but hadn't set the world on fire. It wasn't until Kalis came out in 2005 and rocketed towards the top of the board game geek charts that people really started to take notice of worker placement. In the years that followed, we had a whole bunch of very popular games come out like Tribune, Stone Age and Pillars of the Earth. But it wasn't really until 2008 that worker placement got its dominant position in board gaming. And that was with Agricola. Agricola rocketed to the top of the board game geek charts and stayed there for a number of years. And while it was up there, a whole bunch of other titles came out. And in the following 12 years, there's been hit worker placement games practically every year. Some of the more noteworthy ones include Lords of Waterdeep, Caverna, Everdell, Underwater Cities, Anachrony, and A Feast for Odin. And while worker placement isn't quite as dominant in the hotness these days as it was 10 years ago, in the last year or so we've had On Mars come out, Lost Ruins of Arnak, and Dune Imperium. So worker placement is still a very popular genre. So to recap, what makes a game a worker placement game? Well, it's a game where you place workers on the board and get bonuses. And those workers must be a scarce resource, the placement spots must be scarce as well, and there must be some point in the game where you can take most of those workers off the board to reuse them later. Three Minute Board Games does not do paid content. Support us on Patreon to keep us independent. And if you enjoyed this video, hit the notification button and subscribe to the channel.